Hello, and welcome to the ACP Automation channel. In this video, I'd like to talk about the Siemens Simatic S5 135U PLC with a 928B CPU. Now, the S5 135U, as can be seen here, is classed by Siemens as a top end controller in their S5 PLC family. The S5 135U PLC can be used in single processor or multi processor operation, making this a very powerful PLC for the time. If a 948 CPU is inserted into the rack, the PLC assumes the status of a 155U PLC. The 135U is a modular type PLC, which means it is made up of individual modules, as can be seen here. The first thing to note is the PLC is made up of a rack, which is this thing here. The, this is an S5 135U rack into which control cards can be inserted. Siemens offered a variety of racks to suit a wide range of applications. The power supply is built into the rack. This particular power supply can take an input voltage of either 115 or 240 volts AC. There is a voltage selector on the front, which is this thing here, um, to choose either the 115 or 240 volts. So obviously, if you are fitting a new one, then this switch must be inserted in the correct position for the operating voltage. The power supply also has a plethora of jumpers on board to enable or disable various functions. Unlike the 115 PLC, the power supply does not hold the backup batteries. They are actually attached to the rack. They can be found just under this cover here. These batteries are responsible for maintaining the program in the CPU in the event of a power failure. They are especially important if there is no storage card fitted, like in this instance here. It is good practice to replace these batteries before they go flat. If they do go flat, this is indicated by these yellow LEDs here. For the purpose of this demonstration, I have removed the batteries to show how the PLC responds on startup. Once new batteries have been refitted, the reset switch will need to be operated like so. The first card we come to, this one down here, the first card we come to is the brains of the operation, the 928B CPU. This is where the user program is stored and executed. There is also logic in here to take in signals from the input boards, process them, and then send signals back out to the output boards. This is done via the S5 bus on the back plane. You will notice on the front of the CPU that there is one fixed port and a blanking plate, fixed port, blanking plate, where a second port can be inserted. The first port is where the programmer can connect to. With the programmer connected, you can monitor and force variables, download or upload programs, and make online changes, etc. Alternatively, an, old, an operator panel could be connected here for monitoring the process or setting process variables, etc. The port could also be used to connect the PLC to an L1 network. The second slot is designed to take an interface module. The interface module could be another programming port, or it could be an RS-232 port, RS-485 port, or a Cyanic L1 network port. This particular backplane can accommodate 21 cards in total. Depending on the type and function of the card dictates where the card can be placed. So for example, a CPU can go into slots 2, 3, 4 or 5. A digital input can go into any slot except slot 2. And communications processors can only go into slots 3 to 9. Uh, the first card we come to after the CPU, so this one here, uh, is a communications processor card. This is a CP525 card and gives the PLC the ability to communicate serially with the outside world. Next we have some standard signal modules where the outside world can connect to the PLC. This one here is a 24 volt 32 bit digital input card. So for example, 32 switches, push buttons, photo cells, etc. can be connected here. The state of the sensors are visualized by these LEDs, which you can see on the front. So if the card is receiving 24 volts DC, then the LED will illuminate. The next card, this one here, is a 24 volt 32 bit digital output card. In this case, the outputs are transistors. Here, 32 lamps, sounders, etc. can be connected. And finally, this one here with all the wires sticking out of it, 
um, is a 16 channel analog input card. The next two cards, uh, this one and this one, are communications processor cards. This one here is a CP1430 Ethernet card. Um, this allows the S5 PLC to be connected to an Ethernet network. Traditionally, a CP535 card would have been used to connect the PLC to what was known as a H1 network, or Ethernet as we know it now, uh, but that has been superseded by the 1430. Interestingly, the next card here, this one, is a CP530 card, which would have allowed the PLC to be connected to an L1 network. I think of this as an, like an old type of MPI connection. The next card, this one here, is classed as an intelligent I.O. card called the WF470 card. This card allows the PLC to build SCADA pages onto a monitor for displaying alarms, plant states, etc. I may do some videos on these individual cards to show how to parameterize them. Uh, one thing to be aware of is that these cards can hold their parameters on RAM or EEPROM. If RAM is used to hold the parameters, then the backup battery is responsible for maintaining the memory in the event of a power failure. So it's very important uh, that you know how to parameterize these intelligent cards. The final card we come to, this one here, is an IM308A card. This allows the PLC to connect to remote I.O. stations or have remote racks up to several kilometers away. As this is just an overview video of the 135U PLC, I haven't gone into too much detail about the individual cards or indeed any of the S5 programming. The main reason for this video is to show you how the 928B CPU reacts after power failure and having flat batteries in the power supply. So let me start by powering up the PLC. So it is important to note the state of the LEDs when the power is restored, as this can influence the startup behaviour of the PLC. This particular type of power supply should have three green LEDs illuminated. Uh, this shows that the 24 volts, the 15 volts and the 5 volts DC power supplies are all functioning correctly as shown here. The other thing to notice is the yellow LED. Uh, this shows that the battery is flat. Even if I try and reset it, as you can see, it will not reset. An interesting point to note here is whilst the battery error is true, the CPU runs OB34, so code could be inserted in here to handle this type of exception. As the battery has been removed and the power has been lost and I don't have a backup module installed, it's no surprise that the program has been lost. I could imagine that opening the control panel door and seeing the CPU in this state could be quite alarming, but if you have an up-to-date backup of the program and a programmer, you should have this backup and running in no time at all. So as can be seen, the stop light is flashing quickly and the bus light is on. This indicates that the CPU needs to have an overall reset performed. The bus light means that all outputs have been disabled. To perform an overall reset, I will put the mode switch into the stop position, then I will put the momentary contact switch into the overall reset position as shown. Overall reset. I will then go on the mode switch, I will go run, stop and let go of the momentary contact switch. Um, you will notice that the red stop LED has stopped flashing and now illuminated solid. This means that an overall reset has been performed and the CPU should go into run. To get the CPU to go into run, I will put the momentary contact into the reset position and then put the mode switch into run. So as you can see, if everything is okay, the PLC should go into run as it has. So that comes to the end of my video. As shown here, it is important to keep the batteries refreshed and also have an up-to-date backup of your program. I hope you've enjoyed this video and please remember to subscribe. Thanks for watching. Bye.